Welcome back. As you know, I am Eli the Computer Guy, and this is Silicon Dojo. Silicon Dojo, authorityless, gatekeeperless, free to the end user, hands on technology education here in Asheville, North Carolina, that empowers our students to do whatever the hell it is that they want to do. I do want to make sure that you know that all of our classes here at Silicon Dojo are based on the train the trainer model. What this means is not only are we trying to train you in whatever the subject matter is, but we're trying to give you the materials and the information so that you can go back to your own people and teach them what we have taught you. Uh, so in the YouTube world, I have people you know all over the world that have watched my videos and they have been able to become empowered and get jobs jobs and create businesses and the whole nine yards. My concept with Scaling Silicon Dojo is that I teach my students and then my students are able to take this material to go back to whatever country they're from or to go to whatever uh, people that they're interacting with and to teach their folks. So whether you want to teach this at a Boy Scout group, you want to teach this uh, within your business environment, any of those types of things, all of the material that we offer should be on SiliconDojo.com. So that will be the slides, that will be the code examples, all of those things. So please take this information and feel free to use it as is or to modify it uh, for your organization's needs. Now I do believe my catchphrase for the next decade is going to be, I barely get paid to teach you folks. I sure as hell don't get paid to troubleshoot your problems. This is a big thing in the technology world, right? Because so many of the projects that we work on in the realm of technology rely on subsystems, rely on hardware. In order to make something like a Python script work properly, you need to make sure your hardware is working properly, your operating system is working properly, your security and your permissions, your device drivers, all of that stuff is working properly <clears throat> to make sure your Python script can print something out on the screen. So I believe in standardization, 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 standardization. To be clear, if you're going to be doing this for your organization, standardize on whatever hardware and operating system that you want. But here at Silicon Dojo in Asheville, we have standardized our computers on the 2012 MacBook Pros. The reason for this is we install the latest version of a Ubuntu desktop onto these MacBook Pros, and when we do, the webcams uh, device drivers work right out of the box. If you use older or, or newer, I guess newer versions of MacBooks, uh, Ubuntu actually will work fine on all the Intel systems, but a lot of times things like the webcam doesn't work properly. Uh, so we use a 2012 MacBook Pro. We slam a 256 gig uh, SanDisk solid state drive in there. We actually leave them with the four gigs of RAM, for what we're doing, four gigs of RAM is fine. Um, and, and away we go. So Ubuntu with the 2012 MacBook Pro. The other thing I like about the 2012 MacBook Pro is that when we're dealing with things like server classes, this actually has the, the hardwired built-in network card. So if we were going to do something like uh, Linux, just the server without the desktop, that works a lot easier if you can just connect it to a hardwired connection. So I really do find these old 2012 MacBook Pros just they're phenomenal. They solve our problems perfectly. And they generally cost you somewhere around 150, somewhere between 130 to $170 on backmarket.com. Uh, we have purchased, just so you know, we're not an affiliate of them at all. We have purchased 15 of these 2012 MacBook Pros from them. And, and overall, we've been pretty happy. So that's the standard uh, hardware and software that we use. If you're going to use something else, just realize you might run into problems. I literally had a, um, a student of mine who is a professional programmer that's coming to these classes for, I don't know, some reason. And uh, he actually had like a brand new state-of-the-art M2 MacBook Pro. And he was like, why, why am I going to use you know Ubuntu on an 11-year-old computer? I'm going to use my fancy thing. Uh, the interesting issue was... He had all kinds of troubleshooting problems. He ended up spending half the class troubleshooting his computer. And I kept being like, hey, you know the potato, the potato sitting right beside you? <laughs> it will finish all of the labs in this class just fine. Uh, so anyways, that's something that you do have to think about. And again, especially for students, if you're going to be building these projects, one of the questions you have to ask yourself is, are you sure you didn't, co your code is incorrect, 
Or could it be that your permissions aren't right? Or could it be that you don't have the right updates or whatever? Or could it be some other weird wonky issue? What I've seen a lot of new programmers, one of their big problems is they write code, they go to run the code, they fail, it fails for whatever reason, they keep re-editing the exact same 10 lines of code for the next three hours, and then they put their hands up in a fuss and say, I guess I don't know how to code. And then what you find out is, no, their code was actually perfect the first time, eh, but their security permissions or something else, that was the problem. So anyways, standardize, standardize, standardize. This is what we standardize on. So I do just want to take a second to throw a little bit of advertising into this video. Uh, so again, um, all the classes that I'm teaching here on YouTube, we actually do these in person here in Asheville, North Carolina. And one of the things that we've started to do is fireside chats. So I bring in real technology professionals, real CEOs, real founders, real the whole nine yards. Uh, and basically we sit down with them and we have a conversation about how they do what they do. We're not talking about functions, we're not talking about variables and that type of thing, but we're asking the question, why did you choose the stack that you chose? Why do you prov uh, did you choose the cloud providers that you do? Why did you decide uh, to, to outsource to Brazil versus Ukraine versus India? Those types of questions. What I see is so many students, uh, they learn how to do the, the technical skills, right? Uh, to be a technology professional, but then they have no idea what the professional skills are to be a technology professional. Uh, so that's why we bring uh, folks in. So we're going to have Jacob Haug uh, here. Uh, he is going to be here in a few weeks. Uh, so this is going to be June 13th, uh, 2023, here at the Hatch Innovation Hub in Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, so he actually has created a really cool uh, remote management system. Uh, so if you remember the old days of SMS, uh, not messages, uh, SMS server messaging, server management service uh, from the Windows world, where you could remote control uh, different computers. Uh, think about SMS, think about VNC, think about remote desktop. Basically, he's come up with a modern version of that kind of platform. And so we're going to have him come in and we're going to talk about what it's really like to build that type of platform. And beyond that, what it's like to build a business or a startup company uh, trying to provide that type of platform. So if you're interested in this, do make sure you join us on the meetup group, Silicon Dojo here in Asheville, North Carolina. And please come, Any, anybody's invited, you know, more the merrier. And finally, before we get into the class, I will remind everybody, we work for tips. Uh, yeah, YouTube advertising isn't paying us very much anymore. I think last Saturday I made $18 on the main channel. Yeah, that, that's not a joke. Uh, there's a long time there where, where I did very well in the YouTube world. I didn't really talk about how much money I made because my wife actually asked me not to. Uh, yeah, it is, it is no longer that era. I am no longer flush with YouTube money. I made 18 bucks on Saturday, and it's not a hell of a lot better most days of the week. So I will remind you, uh, computers cost money. Rental on this facility costs money. Internet access costs money. Yeah, again, MacBook Pros cost money, all those types of things. Uh, with Silicon Dojo, I want people to be able to come and not have to worry about the money. That basically the idea is that we disconnect, we abstract the financial component from the actual educational component. <laughs> but just because we abstract it out doesn't mean it goes away. Uh, it's still there. So if you find this to be valuable and you have some extra money to throw in every month, please think about, uh, you know, clicking on the donor box link down below or whatever crowdfunding link that we have uh, to throw some money in to help support Silicon Dojo. Uh, this really does matter. Uh, we have a runway for, for a decent amount of time, but you know, <laughs> The, run, the runway ends, and if we, we don't we don't get escape philosophy, uh, we're gonna we're gonna hit the trees pretty fast. So if you like what we're doing, think about uh, think about throwing some tip money in. Okay, so now it's time to jump into this introduction to SQL class. So SQL is Structured Query Language, SQL. And in today's class, we're going to be using our Linux computer. We're going to install MySQL, which is a uh, server software, uh, database software. We're going to install that. And at the end of it, we're going to use Python. So basically, at the end, we're going to use Python in order to communicate with the MySQL server and then use SQL to put information in 
into the server and pull information out of the server, and it should be a, should, should be a pretty good fun time. A SQL structured query language is a standardized language that's used on most relational databases. So whether you're using MySQL, MariaDB, Postgres, whatever else, uh, SQL, the basic concept of SQL, uh, should work with all of these different uh, different database uh, databases. Uh, so that's just something to keep in mind. Now you will see me reference uh, the notebook. Uh, so when we create these classes, I actually create a workbook along with these classes, and then basically we go through this workbook. So if you have not printed this out, I would highly recommend you print this out so you can follow along. It'll make it a lot easier to, to follow along with this particular class. Now the first thing to talk about as we jump into this SQL class is to disabuse you of the idea of the quote-unquote best programming language. It's adorable. I get so many, uh, you know, viewers out there, people ask me questions, and they're like, Eli, what programming language should I learn? And it's like, aw, you have no idea what's going on, do you? That's adorable. The important thing to, to understand when you're going to go out and when you're going to be building projects is generally speaking, uh, you're going to be using multiple different programming languages. Again, programming languages all solve specific tasks. And so whatever task you're currently dealing with, uh, you're going to pick the appropriate language for that task, right? So if we go over here, make sure where this ends. Uh, so you're going to go to a website, right? So you have a server, a web server, let's say www.silicondojo.com, right? And when you go to this web server, uh, you may have a form. So basically, uh, a user goes to the server, they plug in some information, and then they submit that uh, to, your, to your app. You know, that information may be uh, their user account information. That information may simply be a query in order to get a report out, something like that. Uh, with that, you're going to be using HTML to create that basic form. Now you have that basic form, it's just HTML, it's pretty damn ugly to be honest with you. So you're going to make some colors, you want to have some rounded boxes, and you know, some buttons and that kind of stuff, and then you're going to use CSS. So that's going to make all the color, make it all kind of pretty. Then once you have that, one of the issues you're going to run into is like, yeah, but what if my users try to submit stupid information? Like what if they start trying to submit telephone numbers where the email address is supposed to be? Or they start trying to submit in, in, incomplete email addresses or that type of thing? Well, then you can use JavaScript. And then basically the JavaScript programming language on the page itself will validate all of the information, verify at least looks proper uh, before it gets sent uh, to the back end server to get processed and that type of thing. So that's what you've got on the front end. So then JavaScript or HTML, whatever you have, is going to send this information back to your back end server. So this is generally going to be a Linux server. And when we talk about a back end programming languages, uh, what we use here at Silicon Dojo is a programming language called Python. Another language that I like, <laughs> you're not supposed to say it, PHP is a darn good language. I'll stick by that. Might be PHP, might be Ruby on Rails, may even be something like C Sharp. But basically what happens here is either HTML or JavaScript, they send the information uh, back to the uh, the web server, the backend language, the backend language, whether it's Python, PHP, uh, uh, Ruby on Rails or C Sharp is then going to take that information, it's going to parse it, it's also going to do its own verification and that type of thing, and from there it's going to have to dump it into a data store. So a data store, many times in our classes we just use a basic text file, something called a CSV text file, where basically you turn all the values uh, into essentially a... Uh, a column, you put commas in between, and then you save that to a text file, and then you can read to it, right? So that's a lot, what a lot of times what we do is we simply send it down to a text file. And with that, you can do that from Python, PHP, Ruby, or C Sharp. They all know how to do that. But text files are kind of crappy. <laughs> a text file is a text file, right? You got a simple piece of software, nothing really complicated. You definitely don't have to worry about security. Dumping to a text file is just fine. But a lot of times, right, you want to you want to have a lot of records, you want to be able to sort, you want to be able to search, you want to filter, you want to do a whole bunch of different stuff. And so if that's the case, then you're going to need to send the information that came from the web server, you're going to need, going to, need to send it to a database server. And so the database server um, is generally going to be something like MySQL, 
MariaDB, Postgres, SQLite. We're not going into MongoDB and the NoSQL databases, just follow me here, right? So this database server, let's say it has uh, MySQL on it. And so what Python is going to do is it's gonna take all the information that comes from the front end server. It's then going to turn that into a SQL statement. So uh, insert, into table, blah, 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 right? So Python basically sends this SQL statement to the SQL server, and then that's what stores the values into the database on that SQL server. If your, your front end user then wants some information, uh, wants to be able to pull reports, invoices, whatever the hell it is your app is doing, Basically, what's going to happen is your back-end uh, programming language will, again, do a query, do a SQL query on the database server, pull the information out. Then once it's pulled the information out, it will then format it properly. So however it's, it needs to get formatted to be sent to the front end, once it's formatted, it will then get sent to, sent to the front end, and the front end will display it. So the important thing to understand is when people say, Eli, what language do I need to learn? It's like, well, <laughs> pick a few, pick a few. <laughs> and this is simple, this is simple. You have HTML, CSS, and JavaScript on the front end. You have Python, PHP, Ruby, C Sharp, or whatever in the middle. And what we're going to be dealing with today is SQL structure query language, which is truly its own language. So this kind of gives you an idea about, you know, mentally how all of this is gonna work and where SQL fits into the overall platform. Now let's take a moment to talk about relational databases. So again, when we talk about things like databases and database servers, it's important to understand, you know, in the technology world, there's a thousand ways to skin a cat. Somebody says, just use a database. And it's like, yeah, great. <laughs> Which type of database? <laughs> which product of database server, there's a whole bunch that goes into this. What MySQL is and a good uh, database type to generally go with is something called a relational database. What a relational database is, is imagine, think about it, imagine if you had spreadsheets, so Excel spreadsheets or whatever else, basically you had these spreadsheets and then within those spreadsheets you had values, you know, within the records and then if those values could be associated with with other spreadsheets, right? So normally, like you think about a spreadsheet, right? So you have this, and uh, let's say for a user account, you know, the, the column name, uh, you would have the ID for the column, you'd have the name of the person, you'd have the age of the person, and let's say you'd have a where the person works. One of the big problems you run into is if you have a single table, what if you want additional information? What if you want the work address? What if you want the point of contact at the work? What if you want all of this stuff, right? Putting this all into one table becomes a bit of a disaster. So what you can do, what you can do, let's say again, you have like a CRM solution here, is you can have, let's make sure, okay, so you have one table and it has, uh, has ID to start with and then name and then age and then it has employer, but instead of having employer, what if you just had employer number, right? So basically you have Bob, or no, you have ID one, uh, name Bob, age 33, and he's with employer number 14. You then have an employer table. In this employer table, you have the employer ID, you have the name, you have the address, you have the phone number, whatever it is you want. And then basically in this, you have a whole bunch of different records. Down here at record 14, you then have, you know, what the name is, what the address is, all of the information about the employer. And so you have uh, a basically like a user, a client table, you have an employer table, you may have a product table. And so the idea here is that every table is very specific to like one type of information and then using identity you do something called join the tables together. So temporarily kind of super glue them together to make queries on a much larger table, right? So basically you could join this to say, I want to know Bob's address 
And so with this, you would join the tables on employee record number 14 so that you could simply say, Bob is at whatever address that it is. This is what a relational database looks like. Now with this, as I've explained it, this is called a schema. So you will hear the no, a type of database called NoSQL, and NoSQL is awesome because it's called a schema list, right? So you may hear of schema list database types, and those are phenomenal because you don't have to do all this pre-planning. <laughs> and again, we know modern computer geeks, plan, plan, that's no fun. <laughs> one, of the thing, one of the good points and the bad points you run into with a relational database is you have to initially create the schema. Basically, you create the tables, you create um, the columns for the tables, you create, you tell it what data type each column should be, an int, a float, a bool, uh, a blob, there's a whole bunch of different data types that you can use. And basically, you code all of this out initially, and then more or less, it's set in stone. You know, it's stone, you can carve every once in a while, but more or less, you really shouldn't screw with a lot. The idea being is that if you do need to modify the schema, you can do an alter command. And so with an alter command, you could drop a column, you could add a column, you can change things. But you know, <laughs> any tech professional knows what happens when you change things. Everything goes boom. <laughs> you, you, you get out your 20-sided your die and you roll it. And on a one, your entire infrastructure goes boom. <laughs> it's only a one out of 20 chance, but it is a one out of 20 chance. Um, and so that's one of the things to be thinking about uh, when you deal with relational databases and MySQL or whatever else, is that you are going to build out this schema initially, and you really need to plan. You know, data type of name should be text. Data type of age should be int. Data type of price should be float or decimal, right? Make sure you really understand not just the columns you want, but the data types you want, how the table should be laid out, uh, the whole nine yards, because this is a big thing in the relational database world. So I'm going to be teaching you SQL today, Structured Query Language. And this is kind of like the standard language you're going to use to communicate with relational databases. But it is important to understand that there are many different database server products out there and understand the difference kind of between the language and the functionality of the server. So everything that I'm teaching you today should be fine. If you're dealing with WordPress sites, if you're creating basic apps, you're not going into replication schemes or read databases and write databases and read write databases and master databases. If all of that doesn't make a damn bit of sense to you, don't worry about it because we're not going to go into it today anyway. But the important thing to understand is that there are many database server products out there. Uh, so we're using MySQL today. There's MariaDB. There's Postgres. There's SQLite. There's a whole bunch of different products. And it's important to understand that they actually have different features and functionalities functionalities, and sometimes they're designed to, to do things uh, better than, than other pieces of, of database technology. And so just kind of keep that in mind. So if you sit down again for a Postgres server or something else, and you're, you're trying to type out a SQL command and something may not be working properly, just realize in that database server, in order to do something, it might just be slightly different than how you do it in MySQL or whatever. Again, have I, have I told you about standardization? It's a beautiful thing. Uh, the other thing to, to realize is that whenever we're dealing with MySQL, there is a fork of MySQL called MariaDB. So MariaDB, horseshoes and hand grenades, 99% the same as MySQL. Uh, what this is about, just so you understand what's going on, is that MySQL started as an open source company. Uh, years ago, there was a company called Sun Microsystems. It was struggling. It had been doing uh, Unix workstations for years. It had been like the premier vendor for Unix workstations. And then people realized, you know, Windows, Intel uh, computers, 
for just a hell of a lot cheaper. Uh, their market share was collapsing. They were trying to figure out, you know, how how they could go into the future. And so they decided that they were going to become the open source company. So Sun Microsystems went out uh, and they bought MySQL and they bought OpenOffice and they bought a whole bunch of different open source projects because their idea is that they were going to be the keepers of open source projects. And again, if you've been in the technology world for any amount of time, you probably know how bad this goes at the end. Uh, so sadly, sadly, that was not the way to become a successful company in the early 2000s. They were floundering. They needed to be acquired before they went bankrupt. And so, in pure irony, uh, Oracle bought them. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of people argue about whether Steve Jobs or Bill Gates are like the most evil people in the technology world. And any people that have that argument haven't been in the technology world for very long because we all know it's Larry Ellison. <laughs> Larry Ellison is the worst of the technology world, in my opinion, in my opinion. So anyways, Oracle is, is Oracle. It's, it's, it's an interesting company to have to deal with. Uh, so a lot of people basically had a very bad day because MySQL was being used in enterprise class servers. Uh, large e-commerce sites at the time were using MySQL. The idea is the software itself was open source, uh, but then you would pay the consulting fees. The issue is MySQL is essentially a competitor for Oracle. So then the question comes up, you know, is Larry Ellison, <laughs> the Larry Ellison we all know and tolerate, <clears throat> How's he going to deal with owning an open source competitor to Oracle that makes them billions and billions of dollars? So there's a really big concern about what would happen to MySQL. And so that's where the, the uh, MariaDB fork came in. So since MySQL was open source up until this point, uh, basically they forked it, a whole group of peep forks, uh, folks forked it into MariaDB and they've been taking it along. And oddly enough, you know, MySQL's actually not too bad after about a decade. A surprise! Surprise! Even Larry Ellison isn't a complete jackass all the time. Uh, and so basically the issue that you run into is with MySQL, if you start doing like the enterprise class stuff, uh, again, replication servers, read write servers, all that kind of thing, uh, then you start running into licensing fees and stuff that you have to deal with. Uh, but basically if you keep it pretty simple, again, WordPress sites, that type of deal, uh, MySQL is, is basically licensed and is pretty good as it's always been. Uh, but you might run into MariaD where you might run to MariaDB, especially for Silicon Dojo projects, is on Raspberry Pi. So generally, when we install software onto our Linux computer, we go to repositories. For whatever reason, the Pi OS has decided they don't want to they don't want to use a MySQL from a repository, so they essentially try to force you to use MariaDB. But the important thing to understand is even if you install MariaDB, Again, 99.999% of everything past actually installing Maria, MariaDB looks like MySQL. Even the prompts and everything still say MySQL, so so that should be fine. Uh, so that's just some things to think about. Again, in the, the real world of databases and, and all of that. Uh, again, SQL, SQL is SQL. It's a specific functionality of the servers that might be different, but... Again, until you get the, to the enterprise class or start trying to do something really complicated, most of that's going to be over your head anyway. Now, one of the things that you might run into when you start Google searching and learning about MySQL or, or any of the other relational databases is you will hear about something called a, uh, a database engine. Uh, NODB is a database engine. It's called MySAM is a database engine. Essentially, you have, this, you have this database software with the basic functionality. And then what the engines are is the engines uh, basically are components of the database server that are optimized to do search certain tasks. So let's say uh, you have a site where 99.9% .9 of all traffic is simply going to be reading from the site, right? People aren't going to be uploading. They're simply going to be consuming. So you might use a database engine uh, that optimizes for select queries. Uh, or maybe you have a database server and all that's happening is people are pumping data up to it. So you might have a database engine that optimizes for insert queries, adding queries. You might have a database engine that's better for replication. Again, if you have a cluster of servers, 
all of that kind of thing. Uh, when I first learned MySQL, again, 15, 16 years ago, back with the MySQL folks, uh, it actually did kind of sort of matter which database engine you were using, e even for small projects. The, the main thing that I would say at this point is if you don't know what a database engine is, don't worry about it. Use the default engine that's already on your database server and go from there. The database engine does matter, but it's one of those things that matters at a certain scale, at a certain size. So do, do not waste any brain power trying to figure out the difference between NODB or the rest of them. So that's just kind of a warning on the database engines. Now, one of the good things or, or, or horrible things <laughs> about MySQL is it actually is case insensitive. Uh, so the whole capitalization thing, whether you have an uppercase letter or a lowercase letter, uh, basically in the MySQL world, it doesn't matter. If you use insert all lowercase, it's the same as insert all uppercase. It's all, it's all fine uh, in the MySQL world. I will tell you if it matters for you, for your particular project, uh, let's say you're inputting like file names from a Linux server, anything like that, you can go in, go in and muck with the configurations and actually force a MySQL to be case sensitive, but in general, it's case insensitive. For most things, the case insensitivity won't matter. Again, for, for writing commands and all that, it definitely doesn't matter. The issue where you may run into to, to problems is if you're actually inputting data uh, into your database, and then you might be doing some kind of transformations on that data. So do remember, Again, people's names, that type of thing, you don't really have to worry about the case sensitivity. You can, you can transform that all you want. But again, think about things such as file names. Uh, think about things such as URL addresses where there's different capitalization and it matters because they're talking to a, a Linux server. So one of the problems you may run into is if, if you have case insensitivity, an uppercase X is the same as a lowercase X. So if, you if you've saved files, let's say you have files and case insensitive, case insensitive, they look the same, but case sensitive, they're different for whatever reason. If you're using MySQL and then you do a search query, I am looking for whatever file is, both of those files may pop up and then you might run into some weird issues. So this is just kind of one of those things just be careful about uh, with the, the project that you're going to be designing for. Uh, one of the issues that we run into in the technology world when we're creating projects uh, uh, is like with this case and sensitivity is different things care about cases. So your HTML isn't gonna care about cases. A Linux server is gonna care about cases. The MySQL server isn't gonna care about cases. And so you can run into when you're designing your app, especially when you start doing text transformations, you can run into a problem if you're not really thinking through the data and what the data is going to be used for. Again, if you have a, if you have a, uh, a field in your table and that field is simply you are or file name, right? Because of that case insensitivity, you might run into some, some quirky issues. So just something to keep, think, keep in mind. Now do remember, if you have not heard this before, this is very important in the database world, garbage in, garbage out. Do remember, databases are not magical. Even technology professionals sometimes think, think things happen Magically, right? There's this idea. I put data into the server. I get data back. But you really have to be thinking about what kind of data are you putting in the server? Are you verifying the data? Are you transforming the data properly? Are you sanitizing the data? So sanitizing is where you go through when you clean out the crap, like the, the extra characters or those types of things that you don't, you don't want. One of the things you really have to think about with this database server, especially when you have that front end and back end language that are pumping data to the database server, is making sure the data that goes into the server is clean and also making sure that you actually need the data. One of the big weird things over the past decade is uh, people have become data hoarders, right? Like any data they can get, I need all the data. Well, again, remember, the more data you ingest, take into your database, that's the more resources, the CPU cycles, RAM that's going to be used on your server. That's the more storage that's going to be used on your server. And again, per record, for one record, who the hell cares? For millions or billions of records, that really adds up. So just do think about this when you're inputting data into your server. 
you know, do you really need this data? Is this data in the format that it needs to be in the whole nine yards? Because that's it. That's the thing. You're going to get back whatever you put into the server. You put garbage into the server, you're going to get back garbage from the server. You know, servers are not like magical or anything like that. Now, a big thing for the noobs is do remember with SQL, structure query language, the semicolon is the delimiter. So basically, you're going to put in a SQL query. At the end of it, you're going to put a semicolon. You hit enter, and yay, you're going to get the results. Or most likely, you fat-fingered something, and you're going to get an error. But you're going to get something back. Here's the thing. If you don't put that semicolon in, uh, you're not going to get any results back. You basically just kind of get this little arrow thing. And every time you hit enter, you're just going to get this little arrow thing. And you're going to keep getting that until you put a semicolon. So if you put in a query, if you put in a query, and then you're just getting these little arrow things and nothing else, put in a semicolon, and then hit enter, and hopefully your command will just fail out and away you go. So semicolon is the important thing here. Uh, again, this is this is kind of like a query uh, that I did uh, for the class today. So this shows you the MySQL prompt. I do create table client, open parentheses, and then just for readability, all of this can be on one line. So uh, this is not like Python, where white space really matters. This is more like HTML, where white space doesn't matter. All of this can be on one line, but just for readability, you know, you put it on multiple lines so you can see what you're doing. So basically, I did the open parentheses, then I just simply pressed enter. That gave me that little arrow. And then I did ID, int, auto increment. So this is a column, name, text, that's a column, age, int, that's a column, shirt size, text, that's a column. Then I close the parentheses, and none of this runs until I put the semicolon, and then I do enter, and then that's the that's how we get the results. So that's something to be thinking about, again, with the SQL world, if you're just getting these semicolon, enter, you should be good to go. The other big thing to be thinking about in the database world is that data type matters. Uh, so whenever you're dealing with um, database servers or a lot of programming languages, again, when we create our variables, uh, many times you assign uh, a data type to the variable. An int is a whole number. A float or a decimal uh, is a decimal point number. Text is text. You got small ints, you got large, uh, you got tiny ints and small ints and large ints and all kinds of different ints. You have floats and you have bools and you have all kinds of different data types. This is just something to, to be thinking about uh, when you're creating your database. Again, think about prices or if you're doing tax. If you do price int data type, that means it'll remove everything past the decimal point and yeah, your app is going to be pretty bad, right? Uh, or on the other hand, again, if you're thinking about things like prices uh, and then you start getting floats or it goes out to the, the eighth digit past the period, that's also going to run you into some problems. So that's just going to be something to think about. And again, realize that's where we go when we talk about that whole schema thing. You need to design this initially. You don't really don't want to have to screw with this once you've already created it. So enough talky, talky, talky. Let's get to typey, typey, typey. Uh, so we're going to be looking at a lesson one in our little workbook, install MySQL server. So again, we are going to have to install this onto Ubuntu. So we're going to go to terminal, wherever terminal is for you. It may be down over in the, the all app section. We are then going to get our command prompt. And here, what we're going to do is we're going to do sudo app in install my SQL hyphen server, right? So make sure that you're online. So this is going to go online and, and, and pull the, uh, the, the software down from the repository. So make sure you're on your Wi-Fi connection or whatever else. As long as you are, you put that in. It's going to ask you for the password. And here at Silicon Dojo, we are super concerned about cybersecurity. That's why our passwords are one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, I make this a joke, but again, we are an educational facility. We're not the NSA. Um, it's amazing how quickly students forget things. <laughs> Literally in the class, I had certain students that decided to put in whatever password they wanted to put in, which I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. You want to put in your own password, whatever. And then they forgot their passwords. <laughs> and then I lost my mind. <laughs> So I know it sounds goofy to say password one, two, three, four, five, six, but my biggest threat as an educator 
is my students forgetting what the hell the password is. So that's why we use it. I'm going to press enter. We're going to get the whole reading packages thing. Now for me, I had actually previously already installed uh, uh, MySQL server onto this. Um, so this all already, this is installed when I did that. Uh, for you, you'll get a little prompt that says yes or no do yes, uh, and then it should install for you. And, uh, and there you go. Now you've got your SQL Server installed. Now one of the things that I do want to show you is that uh, when you install SQL Server, you actually do have a folder uh, with all of the files for SQL Server. Uh, so if I do clear, don't follow along quite yet. I'm going to go into MySQL, right? So I'm going to go sudo MySQL. This is going to drop me into MySQL. And once I'm in MySQL, I can actually run a command that says select uh, at, at uh, data dir. And I hit enter, and this is the data directory for the MySQL database. So all of the databases that we are going to create, um, all the settings, all of that kind of stuff are going to be in this particular uh, file folder. So var lib MySQL. Um, I can actually go, uh, I can do sudo ls hyphen l uh, var lib uh, my, S, my SQL password. And there we go. We actually see that we are in uh, this particular folder and it has all of this different information. You will notice uh, for most of the files that the MySQL is the, the owner user and the, the group owner uh, of the uh, the file, uh, but this is where, where this is. This, though, is to show you how a lot of the ransomware attacks are currently happening. You will hear, and like you'll read in the news, where there will be a ransomware attack, uh, but, but the administrators will say, don't worry, they don't have your information. Doesn't that seem a little weird? Well, wait a minute. The hackers were able to encrypt the database. Doesn't that mean they had access to the database? Hmm. Remember in the technology world, we have to think about what we're actually doing. They had access to the database file. They didn't have access into the database, right? So access into the database, right? With MySQL, there are user accounts and there's passwords and all that to be able to access the database, create tables, do queries on tables and the whole nine yards, right? That's inside MySQL. But the MySQL uh, database files actually simply reside in a folder on the server. So what happens is the hackers are able to compromise the folder on the server and then they simply encrypt the entire database file and Bob's your uncle, as they say. Uh, this is one of the, the big issues. And this is one of the things that I argue about in the modern world of technology and cybersecurity, where it's not really that the hackers are smart, it's that most of the admins are so damn dumb. And it really, it's, it's getting to the point. Like I honestly do not understand why more administrators are not being sued for gross negligence at this point, because how this is able to occur. Notice I got in here using sudo. Uh, but imagine if you had MySQL installed onto a Windows server in an Active Directory environment. So in an Active Directory environment, there are different user accounts with security permissions and different group accounts with security permissions. There is something called global administrators, or at least they used to be called global administrators. I'm not sure what they're called in 2023, but same concept there, right? And what a global administrator is, is, that it is it's an account uh, that's in a user group it's basically allowed to do anything on the network. They're able to create users, they're able to delete users, they're able to create files and folders, they're able to add uh, servers to the Active Directory um, uh, network uh, or cluster or, and remove them. They're basically able to do anything. Because again, if you're going to go in, you're going to do, do administrative tasks, you need the permissions to do the administrative tasks. Here's the issue, best security practice? <laughs> half-assed security practice is basically administrators should have their own accounts for things like email and print services and Slack and all of that with a standard set of user permissions. So the administrator should have a normal user account basically like every other user on the network so that if they are sent malware, if they are clicked, click on a bad link, they click on the bad link, the executable triggers, 
but then they don't have permission to do anything, and so it fails, right? Again, you think about layers of security. The problem is with a lot of these uh, these, these system administrators is, again, it's it truly is gross negligence. What happens is they actually set up their email and their Slack and their, their web browsing and all of that onto the account that has global administrative privileges. So when they get a spear phishing attack or a phishing attack or whatever else, that executable file comes in, that executable file gets triggered. Well, guess what? That executable file gets triggered with the security policies of whoever the hell is logged in. And the person logged in is a global Active Directory administrator, which means that malware can do whatever the hell it was programmed to do. And so if it decides to go and look for specific folders called MySQL, go into those folders and encrypt the entire database, it has the permissions to do that. Um, so anyways, that's just kind of one of those, you know, cybersecurity. Again, I talk about that a lot of times, like cybersecurity really isn't that impressive. And I know a lot of people poo-poo that, oh, you're just, you're just being a hater on cybersecurity. It's like, no, it's, it's good. Good administration is impressive. If you do good sysadmin work, your need for cybersecurity <laughs> decreases significantly because it's already built into the systems that you have deployed. Uh, so do just be careful about this and just keep this in mind. Uh, so MySQL actually is sitting in this uh, folder, var lib MySQL. And when we create a database in a few minutes, it would actually pop up here if we took a look at it. So now we're gonna go to lesson two and just basically give you an overview of the navigation of MySQL. We're gonna go into the MySQL database. We're gonna look at the built-in databases that already exist. We're gonna use a database. We're gonna show some tables. We're gonna describe a table to understand uh, the, the, the fields and the data types there. We're gonna do a select from the table. That's gonna be kind of crappy. And then we're gonna exit out. This is basically just a simple getting you to understand how this works, right? So we are sitting here at our command prompt. And so this is the Linux command prompt. One of the big things to keep in mind, especially when you're using Linux servers, is make sure you understand what shell you're in. So this is Linux. What we're about to go into uh, is uh, MySQL. If we're using Python, Python has its own thing. And so one of the things that people can get confused about is since it's just command prompt, they just start typing Linux or they start typing whatever commands and it fails out. They don't understand why. And the reason is, is because because you're, you're inside uh, basically another piece of software. Uh, so initially, initially when you install MySQL, the only user account that has access uh, to the information within MySQL is the root level account. So we're going to type in sudo and simply my SQL. So by doing this, this will drop us into SQL. So we can do a whole bunch of, of stuff with sudo my SQL. So just using the root level account and not create any users. We can create tables, we can create databases, we can do all that kind of stuff. So if you're just playing around, don't worry about creating additional user accounts. Why the additional user accounts really matter for you uh, is when the pl when we start building a platform, when we start building software, because in order to connect to the MySQL server, you're going to have to have a, a, a new user account that's been created with the appropriate permissions. So that, that's, that's when you jump over to actually needing to create uh, user accounts. So I hit that. And uh, there we go. We are now we are now sitting in MySQL. I can hit Control L. That will clear the screen for me, just so I can try to try to keep this up here, so it's easier for you to see. Uh, the first thing I can do is I can say Show Databases, uh, and then semicolon. So Show Databases. What this is going to do is it's going to show us what databases are in this particular server. And as we can see, we have the built-in databases. We have an information schema database, a MySQL database, a performance schema database, and a sys database. So these databases should always be in there. And then when we create databases, that will get added to this. Just to show you how this works, when I want to go into a database, let's say I want to go into MySQL, I can do use MySQL. And that's going to drop me into that specific database. You have to be in the database before you can start dealing with tables and all of that kind of stuff. So I go into use my SQL and it says database has changed. And so I am now in the database. Control L just to clear the screen. From there, I can do show tables. Oops, show. 
And so what show tables is going to do is it's going to show me all the tables that are in this particular database. So a big thing when you're going in and you are administering a database, especially adding tables, sure as hell when you're dropping tables, you always want to make sure where you actually are. So that's where you'll notice programmers or, you know, coders keep typing out these commands sometimes like show all that kind of thing to make sure that they, 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 they are, they are at where they actually think they're at. Uh, so again, this says tables in MySQL. So I know that I'm in the MySQL database. This is showing me the tables. And then there's just a, huge, a number of tables here. Uh, we then have the user table down here. Uh, so basically what we're going to do then is we're just simply going to describe the user table. So describe the user table. So what this is going to do is it's going to show us uh, what columns are in the table and what data types are in those and a whole bunch of other stuff. And you're going to... You're going to get this. Uh, the screen's a little big, so it's a little difficult to see. Uh, I'll show this to you a little bit more, you know, again, in, in future lessons. But just understand, you should see, I don't know, kind of sort of something like that. <laughs> uh, past that, if we want to select out of the user table, we could do select uh, all from user. So what this is going to do is it's going to select all columns, and then all records. So basically it's going to select everything out of the user table. And then again, it's a bit of a mess. One of the problems you get to, especially when I'm trying to teach you, is this is all supposed to be laid out like an Excel spreadsheet essentially, but it can be a really, 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 really long Excel spreadsheet. So if your, uh, if your resolution on your screen is to the size all of this fits on the screen, then it looks nice. Uh, if your resolution is big like mine is, eh, it starts to look like this. So if I'm looking at like this, I'm like, oh, I don't really know what to do here. Uh, one of the things I can do is I can simply get specific columns. And so that's what you're normally going to be doing uh, with MySQL. Uh, so I can say select, let's say user from user. So what this is going to do is it's going to select all the values from the user column in the user database. We click on semicolon, we hit enter, and so now we have the built-in users. Debian sys maintenance, MySQL info schema, MySQL session, MySQL sys, and you will notice root is in there, right? So this simply selects just all of the information from the user column, and again, if you know, if you're trying to print this stuff out and it's too big and it's all turning into a mess, this is a hell of a lot easier way to try to get the information. Uh, past that, again, control L to clear screen. Once we want to get out of MySQL, so you'll notice right now I am in MySQL. So I want to get out of this. I want to start doing Linux commands again. I simply type in exits. And as you can see, we are now back to the Linux prompt. And so that's kind of like a basic idea of how MySQL is gonna work. And now we're gonna dive into the wheeze a little bit. So now we're gonna be on lesson three, create database and tables, all right? right? So when you're dealing uh, with uh, databases, uh, basically think of hierarchical containers. So the database, you have the database server, the database server then contains individual databases. Within those databases are tables for a database. And then within the tables, there are records, right? Uh, so that's important to understand. These are like individual containers you can move around. Think about a database, um, kind of like a folder in the Linux world, right? So this is a folder that all of the documents go into. And then within the documents are records. That's kind of a way to think about it. So we're going to create a database and we are going to be creating some tables, right? Uh, so we are here and we are at the Linux prompt. That's not where we want to be. So we do sudo mysql, hit enter, and we are now in in SQL. Then I'm going to do control L just so I can clear my screen. Uh, we're going to show databases to verify what we're looking at. The big thing in the database world is make sure you know where you are. 
<laughs> Again, that's that's a bit, a bit of a problem, uh, especially when you start getting the command line. It can get confusing because you can start writing things or modifying things in the wrong place. So always make sure you know where you are and what's going on. So we can see that we have the, the four built-in databases here. So we're fine. I'm going to hit Control L to clear the screen. And then I'm going to create a database. Create a database. Uh, and we are going to call this database company just to make life easier. And then I'm going to try to not misspell. Create. Create database company. And then I'm going to hit enter. Query OK. One row affected. Now I want to verify that I did things properly. So show databases. And so now we have company, information schema, MySQL, so on and so forth. So, so I know that I did what I think I did. Again, with this whole schema thing, right? If you, uh, if you screw up spelling, right? You fat finger something, that can cause you a lot of problems. So always just verify you didn't do company or company or something like that. Because if you, if you do that and then you keep going, that will run into problems later. Okay, now that we do that, we're then going to drop in to the new database that we created. So to create tables or to interact with tables, we have to be in the database itself. So we are going to use the command use company. And now we see that database is changed. Once we get in here, we want to make sure what everything looks like. So we're going to say show tables, semicolon. And we're going to see that it is an empty set, doesn't even show us anything. So we have no tables in here. This is a clean database, which makes me happy. Uh, so beyond that, then we're going to create our first table, right? So we're going to create a table. This is going to be for clients. Uh, with this, we're going to have an ID. So we always need an ID number for our records. Uh, we're going to have a name, we're going to have an age, and we're going to have a shirt size, right? Uh, so in order to do that, uh, I'm simply going to type create a table client. Mm. Again, make sure you spell it right. Uh, and then we open uh, the parentheses. Now, what you'll see here is just to make this more readable for you, I can hit enter. And when I hit enter, this command doesn't run. I simply go down to the next line. And so this is what, again, a lot of people will do just for readability to make sure that they're doing things properly. Uh, we will do ID. So ID will give us a unique number to make sure there's a unique value in all of our records. Uh, we will make this an int, so this is a whole number. Uh, we will auto uh, increment. So what this means is every new record, it will, it will have a value of one added. So the first record will be one, the second record will be two, third record will be three, whole nine yards. And then we will call this the primary key. So in the database world, you need keys. You need, a, you need at least one primary key. And this is basically how the database server is going to be dealing with the data within your tables. It's used for, for searches and optimizations and that type of thing. So you may use some something other than an ID for a primary key when you're doing something in the real world uh, for our projects. Again, when you're doing WordPress level stuff, just create an ID, auto increment it, and use it as the primary key. The big thing with this is this makes sure that every record is unique, right? Because if you have two records that are actually identical, the database server isn't going to know which one to interact with and all hell's going to break loose. You shouldn't be able to do it at this point in time, but it might actually be able to happen. So if you had two records of Bob, you know, 22, a large, whatever else, maybe somebody clicked the button really quick on submit, submitted them both at the exact same time or whatever else, if they were literally identical, that's a big problem with the database server. So at least this way, you get you get duplicate records, you get copies, but the ID will be different. Bob at 22 with large shirt size, whatever else, will be record one. That second Bob will be record two, and then you've got to go in and clean it up, but it's something that you can actually clean up. The, the system isn't going to you know, crap the bed. Uh, then we're going to do name. Oops. And then we're going to do, so I do comma. Make sure I do comma. And we're going to go down. I'm going to do name. We're going to make this text. Uh, then we're going to do age. We're going to make this an int, so a whole number. Uh, and then we're going to go uh, shirt size. And we're also going to make that text. We're going to close the parentheses. We're going to do the semicolon. And if everything went well, 
Hey, <laughs> that's the hard part when I do these videos and I really try to not jump cut. I'm not sure everything's gonna work out properly. So anyways, so we have now created this table. Once we've created a table, we wanna make sure that we actually create a table and we wanna make sure that it's where it's supposed to be. So show tables. So tables in company, so we're in the company database, client. So we now know that we have a client table in the company database. But one of the questions is, are we sure it's proper? Or it's, is it right? So that's where you can do DESC, client. So this is small, it'll actually come up properly. And this is where you get decent formatting because it's smaller, right? So we are describing the client table. Uh, fields, what fields we have, what types they are, whether they can be null, primary keys, what the default is, and any extra information. So we have an ID field, that's an int, cannot be null. So null isn't zero, null is nothing. So it can't be null, it is a primary key. Uh, and then we go over here and it's auto incremented. We have a name, um, type is text. Can it be null? Can it be nothing? We actually have, because we haven't done that, we're not getting into that today. This actually allows this to be a null value. So this is something that you have to be thinking about when you're creating this database system, is how do you want things to fail? You want them to fail loud and proud. <laughs> I like my failures to have billboards. I want fireworks going, to, going on behind my failures. One of the problems you have is if, a, if, a, if you have a failure that's quiet, you may not realize that you have a failure. You may run into some really weird problems. And so things like having a null value for name, what if you did something like count based off of name? So you, there's, there's a function within MySQL so you can count how many times um, there is a distinct value that shows up. Well, what if what if you had a bunch of names that were blank for some reason? Again, have, have you had employees? I know a lot of my viewers really hate it when I talk about employees. <sighs> Tough. <laughs> it's my lived experience of having employees. It is shocking what employees will do sometimes. And so they might just not add a name for whatever reason. And so if you're, if you're then pulling uh, from, from the, uh, the database later from the table and doing counts or doing some kind of transformation or whatever, you might run into a problem if, if you have nulls where there shouldn't be nulls. And so one of the things is if you have this so it can't be null, when somebody tries to input into the database um, but there isn't a value for that particular column, it will fail out and then they'll have to deal with it on the user side or whatever. So again, that's kind of the thing to, to be thinking about with us. Uh, again, name, text, age, int, shirt size, text. These can all be, they can all be null and the default is null, but this kind of gives us an idea of what the, uh, the client uh, table looks like. Uh, you can drop a table. Again, I gave you an FYI. Don't drop the table for this class. <laughs> <laughs> uh, FYI, to delete a table, drop table and table name, and then it goes away forever and ever and ever. Do be careful about this. Again, I know I'm sitting here talking about dealing with database servers, but I had a buddy of mine uh, back when I worked in the enterprise world. Uh, she was lovely. <laughs> she was lovely. She didn't know how to set boundaries, though. She was one of those, like, one of the smartest sysadmins I knew who also didn't know how to set boundaries. And so she had been working like 100 hours a week for like the fifth week in a row, which you should not do. I know you, I know we all hear about Elon Musk. Here's the thing, you're not Elon Musk. <laughs> I'm not gonna get into the argument about what Elon Musk should do. I'm just gonna say, you ain't Elon Musk. And so the issue was, she'd been working 100 hour weeks. And so they've been doing this massive migration. So we're the, uh, we're the good sized corporation. They had millions, millions of customers, all kinds of service calls and everything else going on. And we had our main database clusters, right? The, the database clusters for our CRM solution that had everything. And uh, again, refresh cycles for, for the tech world, uh, you know, every three to five years, you, you migrate everything up. And so they had their old cl database cluster and they had their new database cluster. So they had been spending all week migrating everything from the old cluster to the new cluster. And her final job was to take the old cluster offline. And yeah, <laughs> she literally says, she literally says she was so tired. She typed in the command to wipe out the new cluster 
and actually misspelled something, so it errored out. She went, oh, and then she retyped in the command perfectly to wipe out the new cluster. It was one command. It was one line. It was one line that wiped out a database cluster for all the data for the CRM solution for our company. Um, <clears throat> So the crazy thing is, this was 20 years ago, she was not actually fired. She was still considered so valuable, they just sent her home for a week. Uh, but otherwise, she still got paid. She just got told to go get some sleep, which is probably weird in its own managerial way. Uh, but the warning here that I'll tell you is, again, when you're dealing with these databases, if you drop, if you say drop table, or God help you, you say drop database, there's no, are you sure? There's no, well, if you're not sure, you can untrash it, you can recycle it or whatever. It just drops and it's gone and it's gone that quick. It is gone so fast, you couldn't even rip the, 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 the power plug out of the computer to try to stop it from happening. So just be very, very, very careful with that when you start dealing with drops. And that's why in today's class, we're not going to be dropping anything. So now we're going to go to lesson number four, inserting data and tables. And this, I know you're going to be surprised to hear this, is shockingly easy. Again, most things with technology are very easy. I got into a discussion with that with a technology professional recently. And I said, you know, the way that I see it is that basically everything in technology is simply introductory level skills all layered on top of each other to make something very complicated. And he said, no, it isn't. <laughs> And then I went with my beer and walked away because I figured it would be an argument. But anyways, it is important to understand the tech world, it's all pretty simple. It's just a lot of simple stuff layered on each other. Anyways, we're going to insert some data. So we're going to insert data into that client database that we just created. And to do that, it's pretty simple. So we simply type insert uh, into uh, the database that we are going to be inputting into. So this is going to be the client database. Then from here, what we're going to say is what columns we're going to be inserting into. So we're going to say name, age, and... Uh, Shirt, size, and we're going to close that, right? So you'll notice there is not an ID value here because that gets auto-incremented. That gets auto-added. We're not going to screw with that. So we're simply going to add the name, the age, and the shirt size. From here, we're then simply going to say values, if I can spell this. And then we are going to open up the parentheses. From that, we're then going to say Bob, comma, 33. Since it's a number, we don't have to put double quotation marks around it. And then we are going to say a large. And then we're going to do the parentheses. And then we're going to do the semicolon. And then we're going to hit enter. And we're going to say query, OK, one row affected. So we added Bob, age 33, with a shirt size of large. Now again, the important thing to be thinking about with the database, garbage in, garbage out, what are you doing? Notice I typed the word large in here. What happens if people type in words such as shirt size? So some people put in large, and some people put in LRG, and some people put in LAR because they forgot to put G, and then you have all of that in your database. And then how do you deal with it? How you deal with that when you're creating your application is in that HTML form, that initial HTML form, you can create a drop down box. That drop down box or a select box allows you to select a value and then only the value that they get, they selected will get sent to the back end uh, software code, which will then get sent to the database so that you make sure everything looks appropriate, right? So one of those things to, to be thinking about. Uh, now that we have this, um, we're going to, to need some additional records so that we can start playing around. Uh, so one of the cool things, uh, just like with Linux, you have in the MySQL world, if you do up, you simply do the up arrow, uh, you can simply bring up what you had before. And so we're going to add Oh, a number of different records. So Sue, let's make her 14, also make her large, right? Uh, then we're going to do uh, Sam, we're going to make him a 44. Uh, let's make him a medium. So what I want you to do is, again, add five or six records here. And then we're going to do uh, Phil uh, will be 54, uh, also medium. 
and then uh, we can do uh, Fred, and we'll do, I don't know, uh, 50. Uh, we'll make Fred small, so we get a few different sizes in here, so we can take a look. And then we'll do, I don't know, Tammy. Uh, we'll also make Tammy 50, and we'll also make her small. And so now we have uh, all of these records in this client table. Uh, and from that point, we'll be able to select and we'll be able to start doing things with these records. So now we get to lesson five, right? So we've added all of these records. These records have been inputted into the database somehow. And then we can do select. So what a select statement is, is it's actually getting information from that database table. Uh, and then, you know, again, if we're using Python to get that information, we can then send it to the front end or do something else. We can do basic select statements. So select all from client. We can select with just column names. Uh, we can limit how many we get back from a select. We can get specific records. Essentially, we can do search queries um, and we can do some other stuff. So let's just go through here and we'll just, we'll just go and we'll tippy tap type all these different commands and hopefully it'll make sense to you. Again, in order to clear the screen, we do control L and that clears the screen for me. At least, again, it doesn't matter for you. It just makes it so you can see what's going on here. Okay, so select all from client, right? So we're going to select all we're going to select all columns from the uh, the client table and it's going to be all records. All columns, all records. I hit enter. So we can see that ID value auto incremented. 1 2 3 4 5 6, right? So that that makes sure we have a unique ID. We have the names, Bob, Sue, Sam, Phil, Fred, Tammy. We have the ages and we have the shirt sizes. Um, so that's that's it. Select all from client. Uh, if we clear that out, let's say we only want uh, certain columns. So this is an important thing. When you're going to be designing your program, you should only ask for the information that you need, right? The more information that you get that you don't actually need, the more likely it is that quote unquote hackers or journalists <laughs> will get something that you don't think they should. The perfect example of this is uh, there was a governor, I think it is, was it Missouri or Mississippi or something like that? It threatened to sue a newspaper because they said the newspaper had hacked the government system. Here was a thing, the government system that the newspaper was interacting with, uh, the, the newspaper, the journalist, went to a website and then literally just did right click, show source, and there were social security numbers and home addresses and phone numbers. So when you looked at the web page, it only showed the information you were supposed to see. But all of this private information actually got sent to the client, to the user. It just wasn't displayed on the screen. So if you simply did right click show source, you could get all of that information, right? The problem there is when they were doing the queries, they were getting more information that was needed. Select all, and then they were sending all, but then only displaying and they thought they were cute. And the worst part is it's not a joke. Again, I don't try to get into too much politics here in Silicon Dojo, but we can agree that all politicians are shockingly stupid sometimes. And literally, literally, the guy was threatening to have the AG go after the newspaper for this. Real world, real world. Uh, so anyway, so let's say we want to do select uh, and we say name, so the column name. So it's the name of the client and the age. So all we want is the name and the age of the client uh, from the client table, semicolon, hit enter, and there we go. All we get is the name, all we get is the age, I don't know, let's say the shirt size is proprietary, you know, private information. So that way, again, especially if we have Python coming in, we only get the information that we need. Therefore, we don't get any additional links. It's amazing. Good system administration really, really kind of looks like a, like cybersecurity in ways, doesn't it? Uh, anyways, uh, so past that, control L to clear the screen. Let's say we only want to get three results. This is most valuable. We're going to do it. In, in the future, but you can do like order by. So let's say I want the three most recent results, that type of thing. You can actually do a limit statement. Uh, so let's say select all from clients, limits, 
how many do you want to limit by? So we've only got a few records. So we're going to say limit by three. And so what this is going to do is it's going to, it's going to request records from the database and it'll do one, two, three, stop. So that's what we get. Limit three, we get Bob, Sue, and Sam. We get all of their information and it doesn't give us anything else. Uh, again, for this, this isn't really the most appropriate ways to use limit. Normally, like I use limit when I'm doing projects. When I'm getting like sensor values, imagine I'm getting a lot of sensor values in and then I wanna do like averages or min maxes within a time period. So I want the min max and average over the past 10 minutes, the min max average over the past uh, 60 minutes, and the min max average over the past day depending on how often those records are those records are being created i can simply do limit buys so then i get then i only get the values for for the past 60 minutes i only get the values for the past day i only get the values for the past week that type of thing and then i can i can then i can do some transformation and parse and do that type of thing uh, but limits there so that's a nice one uh, we do control l um, and then we can, can do search so we're looking for a specific records so again if we're doing a search query so imagine we have that html form we plug in what it is we're searching for, we do submit, that then goes to Python, then Python is able to submit a SQL statement to the SQL server. And so let's say I'm looking for all uh, of my clients who are above the age of 40. So I can do, let's say select, and I'll do name, comma, age, just to, to do that, from client where age is greater then 40, semicolon, and there we go, right? So we have Sam is 44, Phil is 54, Fred is 50, and Tammy is 50. Pretty simple there. Do remember when we're doing those conditionals, so equals, uh, doesn't equal, greater than, less than, greater than or equal to, or less than or equal to, do remember that greater than 40 means 41 and above you would have to make it a greater than or equal, right? So, uh, so let's say with 50, right? Uh, so if I just do this and I say greater than 50, hit enter, you'll notice all we get is Phil. We'll just get Phil because he's the only one that's greater than 50. If we do greater than or equal 50, we then get Phil, Fred, and Tammy. Again, it's a simple oversight, but it's one of those things that can screw some people up. Uh, past that, then uh, again, if we're searching for something like name, we just want to find somebody's name. Uh, again, select, and let's just say all from client where name equals what, Fred, let's say. If you're following along in the workbook, <laughs> just use whatever names that you've used. So I, I have like Patty in the workbook. I didn't put in Patty, I don't think. So anyways, just use whatever names or values you actually put into your own table. Uh, so with this, this uh, you know, look for Fred. So Fred is at ID five, at age 50, so on and so forth. And my snap needs an update. Uh, now that shows me Fred specifically, but you know, what if I want, what if I want something similar? I want to use wild cards. Uh, so again, select all from client. So I look at this, you know, I've got Bob, I've got Sue, I've got Sam, I've got Phil, I have Tammy. Um, okay, yeah, so with Fred and Sue. So what I can do is I can do Control L, clear the screen, and we can use like, and we can use that uh, with a wild card. Uh, so select uh, all from, oh, what am I doing? Uh, from client where name like, and then we can put uh, double quotation marks, and then we put the wild card. So the wild card means one character or more, one character or more. So I put E, and so what this is going to do is it's going to find any names that have any beginning before E and any anything after E. Right, so I hit enter, and we'll notice this gives me both Sue and Fred because it has E in it. Right, this can be much more complicated. We're just doing this because it's it's simple, right? But what if I'm just looking for somebody with a, a that ends with the word the, the 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 letter E or maybe begins something like that? What I can do there is I can use the same command, but then I can just simply remove the wild card at the end. So anything that has E at the end. And that's what I want to search for. 
I hit enter, and when I do, I only get Sue there. Uh, so that's how you're able to do the like. You're able to do the wild cards. Pretty simple. Okay, and then we're going to clear the screen, uh, and then from that, we're then going to be order buys. Basically, how can we how we can we sort the order of the results that we're getting? Uh, so I can do uh, select. Uh, let's see, uh, all from client order by, this is two words, name, and then semicolon. So it's going to order the results alphabetically by name. And so Bob, Fred, Phil, Sam, and Sue, Tammy, and you can see ID of 154326, so it automatically sorted that. If we want to go in reverse, you simply put in DESC at the end for descending, you hit enter, and then you see Tammy, Sue, Sam, Phil, Fred, and Bob. So it does it in reverse alphabetical order. Uh, one of the important things, we're going to talk about this more as we go through this class, is you want to make sure your database does as much as possible. So, so again, anything in the technology world, any product that you're using, uh, is going to be specifically designed to do a certain task. It may be able to do other things, uh, you know, good enough, but it's going to do some tasks really, really, really well. And so one of the things, issues that you run into when you're creating an overall app is that MySQL could do something, or Python could do it, or JavaScript could do it. Any of these uh, these languages, you know, SQL, Python, or JavaScript, could be able to do something such as sort or give you average values or min-max values or whatever else. The important thing to understand is that MySQL, if you're dealing with the data, is going to be able to do it fastest. So any kind of the data type thing, again, sorting or anything else, do that with SQL and then go up the food chain with Python and JavaScript. Don't have, don't have Python actually trying to figure this stuff out. Um, or that will be a, a bad thing. Uh, so that's basically uh, what you got. Oh, you got with uh, with this. Uh, so we showed you how to select all, select columns. We showed you how to get specific records. We showed you how to limit here. We showed you how to use wildcards and likes for doing searches. And I showed you how to do the order by. Again, boys and girls. <laughs> is literally just commands. Uh, if you want to skip the rest of this class, you can literally just go to a W3 schools and then, right? That's, you're just listening to me talk. The, the real answer here is you just type these commands and these commands work. Now, the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to alter a table. Ah, like, don't do this. Like, generally don't do this. It's a class. I'm showing you what to do. We're going to alter a table. But generally, remember, planning, planning is where everything should be done. You don't want to be modifying later. Again, every it's a one out of 20 roll for whether your entire system goes poof. Uh, but, but what we're going to be doing in a little bit is actually joining tables together. And so I need something to join the tables off of. So I want to create a column called city. And so within the client table, uh, they will have cities for all these different clients. Uh, and then we're actually going to create a, a table for clients. We're going to put some information in, or for cities, we're going to put some information in there for the cities, and then we're going to join them later. So, uh, so we're going to need that city column. Uh, in order to add a column to our table, uh, the first thing that we need to do is describe client. We need to make sure we understand what our client table looks like. So that's fine. I'm going to do control L. And then all we do is alter table client add city text. So alter a table, table name, add or uh, what is it, add or drop uh, the column that you want and then the data type for that particular column. We hit enter, we hit okay. So if we see okay, that should be good. Then we do describe clients. And look at that, we now have ID, name, a shirt size, and we have city down here. So we now have that column uh, for this particular uh, for this, this particular table. Uh, and that's really all there is to altering a table. So now we go to lesson seven, and what we're going to be doing is we can update and we can delete a record. I'm not actually going to delete a record because I don't want to damage anything, but we're going to update a record, right? So we added that column to our client table uh, for city, and now we need to add cities to everybody, right? So uh, I can do a select 
all from client. When I do that, I can see that city is null, which is not what I want. So we have Bob, Sue, Sam, Phil, and Fred. So then from here, what I can do is I can do updates, um, client set city equals ash, oops, a double quotation mark, Asheville, um, where, and then we can do name equals Bob, right? Oops, name equals double quotation marks, Bob. So what this is going to do is where the name is Bob, we are going to set the, uh, the thing to city, right? We hit enter, uh, query okay. So we do control L, we do select all from client. And now we can see Bob is in the city Asheville. The problem that you can run into with that though, is uh, if you take a look at this, what if you had multiple people named Bob? What if you had multiple user accounts with different information, but their first name was Bob? Anybody who had a name of Bob would then have a city of Asheville, which might be a problem. So with this, generally what you do is instead of doing by name or something, this is where you can do by ID. ID one, ID two, ID three, ID four, ID five, and six, right? So I can say where ID equals, let's say four, I'll make Phil also from Asheville, and then I can say six. So, uh, so I'll have a number of people from Asheville, right? Uh, then I do clear, then I do select all from client, and we can see Bob is from Asheville, Phil is from Asheville, and Tammy is from Asheville. Uh, then I can just go up, so I can say two. So I'm taking a look at this, so I wanna change Sue. Um, I can put her in, let's say, Mars Hill, which is a local town. Uh, then I do up again. Let's say I do Sam, Sam is three. Uh, so Sam, I'll do Weaverville. Uh, Weaverville, uh, and then who's the final one is Fred has a null. So there we do five and, um, uh, I don't know. We do a uh, Hendersonville, All right? Then I clear the screen. Then I do a uh, select all from clients. Okay, so now Bob is from Asheville, Sue is from Mars Hill, Sam is from Weaverville, Phil is from Asheville, Fred is uh, from Hendersonville, and Tammy is from Asheville. It's all pretty simple there. Uh, if I wanted to modify, let's say I want to do something like modify an age, uh, basically what I could do is simply come here, and basically I set a different value. So let's say I do set age, uh, age equals, um, let's say we messed it up. She's, she's only 49, darn it. Uh, so set age equals 49, where ID equals six. And I hit that, one row affected. Uh, select uh, all from clients. And uh, now we see that Tammy has been updated to an age of 49. And so that's really all there is to updating. Do be careful on how you're updating. So if, if all you want to do, if you want to simply update an individual record, generally the best idea is to go, the idea is to go with the ID. So you make sure that you're actually doing the right one. If there's a reason, Again, maybe you want to modify all records that have a certain value. That's where you could then modify, like if all shirt sizes, maybe all shirt sizes large, you wanted to add a value for that. That's where you would do shirt size in there. But just do be careful with that because sometimes what you think is a unique value, like again, name might not be as unique as you think it is, especially when you start thinking about a system at scale thousands of accounts, millions of accounts. You probably have some duplicate names in there. That's not most likely what you're going to want to update based off of. So the next lesson is group by. Uh, so for this particular example, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be counting how many people are in each particular town. And we're just kind of doing this because I'm kind of showing you what you can do with MySQL. Again, the big thing in the programming world, really the technology world, is you simply, you figure out what you want to do. <laughs> And then you Google search how you do it, right? I, th I think that's what a lot of people, a lot of new people really don't understand. What real technology professionals know is they know what their systems are supposed to be able to do, and they know what their systems are not supposed to be able to do, and that's about it.
Past that, you Google search. It's like, I know my system should be able to do this. So then I Google search to see exactly how to do it. I know my system shouldn't be able to do that. So let me go out and research what system will be able to do whatever it is that I need to do. Right? Uh, so anyways, this is just a simple group by, right? So what we're going to do here is a select. And then we're going to say count. So we want to count individual names. Oops, select, count. So we're going to have a column, and the, 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 the value in the column is simply going to be how many names are counted. Uh, we're going to then say city, and then we say uh, from clients, and then we're going to group by city. Right, so again, if you want to group everybody who, how many people have different shirt sizes, if all you need is a number on shirt sizes, that type of thing, that might work. Uh, so there we go, group by city, and we do this here, and so we have the city, Asheville, Mars Hill, Weaverville, and Hendersonville, count name, so we have three in Asheville, one in Mars Hill, one in Weaverville, and one in Hendersonville. Again, if we did the group by, and then, um, Let's see here, I go back here, let's say to shirt size from client group by shirt size. Then we can say shirt size, large is two, medium is two, small is two. Again, this is just kind of a way to be able to pull out information from your tables. And now we go to lesson nine, and this shows you some basic math. Again, with this, since we have age, that's a number that we can kind of take a look at. Uh, but this could be like sensor values, temperature values, humidity values, uh, prices, uh, prices of stocks or whatever, any, anything that's numeric, right? So we're going to have um, a count of how many people there are. We're going to say what their minimum age is. We're going to say what their maximum age is. We're going to say what their average age is from the table. Uh, so we're here. We got our nice little prompt and so we can do uh, select and then we do count so this is simply going to count all the uh, the, the 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 values for name and it's going to give us uh, that in the column and then we're going to say give us the value for the min the minimum age in this table then we're going to say give us the value for maximum age in this table then we're going to say give us the value for average age in this table and then we're going to say uh, from client semicolon so how many people minimum age maximum age average age and there we go we have six people the minimum age is 14 the maximum age is 54 and the average age is 40.6667 you'll notice these are ints that's a decimal because that's how that comes out uh, with that particular function within mysql and so again this is this is kind of a way you want to offload as much as your database server can do you want it to do it mysql is optimized to get this information as fast as possible you don't want to have to be doing this in some function within python unless you have to. So this, this gives us that kind of basic numbers. Now we get to lesson 10. Lesson 10 is joins. So this is where you're going to be joining tables together. But in order to join tables together, we need an additional table. So we have the client table. We created the column within the client table for city. So now we need to create a city table so that we can add some additional information, right? So we're going to create table city so the name of our table uh, then we're going to do id uh, again just so we have a, an id for each city uh, it is going to be an int we are going to auto increment we're going to make it a primary uh, key and then we're going to do a comma and go down to the next value it is going to be a city with a data type of text it is going to be a state with a uh, data type of text uh, it is going to be a climate with a data type of text and it is going to be a description with a data type of text then we don't do a, a comma after that we do a semicolon we didn't take a look at this did we do it right did we do it right and then we hit enter and then the question again is did we do it right so we describe city to verify and we go okay so city text state text climate text description text uh, ID is, a, is an int, it's a primary key, it is auto-incremented, so we have created this additional 
table. So now we want to find the distinct values for city within the client table. So each, so we just want to know what cities are in the client table. So we can do select, and then we do distinct function, and then we say city from client semicolon. So give us the distinct cities from client, and that will show us Asheville, Mars Hill, Weaverville, and Hendersonville. So these, those are the cities uh, that we have to deal with. So then we're going to insert values um, into uh, the, uh, the city, the city table with this information, right? So we're going to say insert in, oh, it's been a long day, insert into uh, city. And we're going to say uh, city, state, climate, description, right? Then we're uh, description. Then we're going to say values. And so first we're going to do Asheville. Asheville, right? Then do comma. And then state is in North Carolina. Then do comma. Uh, climate is, um, I don't know, uh, temperate, and then do comma, and then uh, do description, a kind of hippie town in the mountains. And then we're going to close that, we're going to do the semicolon, and hopefully I type that out all right. Yay, one row affected. So that's what we have for Asheville. I'm going to go up by one, and so that then uh, basically allows me to just very easily create a new uh, record uh, here. I'm going to do Mars Hill. So I simply look here and see Mars Hill. Uh, Mars Hill is also in North Carolina. Let's say Mars Hill is also temperate. Uh, and let's say a tiny town with a river. I think it has a river. I hit enter. Okay. So then we do Weaverville. Weaverville. We go here. We uh, delete the values, Weaverville, uh, North Carolina, I don't know, let's call it cold, and um, let's say, um, I don't know, not a hippie town. Okay, and then finally we have Hendersonville, so again I just do up again. And uh, yes, this is the fun, exciting world of being a programmer. <laughs> Doesn't it make you passionate? Also, North Carolina will make it hot because it's, it's a little down the mountain from us. Um, a kind of hot, flat town. There we go. So all of those records have been inputted. I do Control L. I can then do Select All from city and uh, now again it's a little too large for the screen but we have an ID we have a city we have a state we have a climate and we have a description so now we have cities that correspond uh, with what we have um, basically already within the um, within the, the, the client table. Now, one of the things with joins is there's, there's a couple of different joins. There's what's called an inner join, a left join, and a right join. So in order to get ready for that, I want to create two records that don't match. So we want to create a client that has a city that doesn't match with cities. And we want to create a city record that doesn't match for a client. And I'll show you why when we start doing the joins. Uh, so let's let's do the, uh, the insert into city. Uh, so we have Hendersonville there. Uh, so let's just, uh, I don't know, uh, do that. And then just type in Hickory. So we're going to type in Hickory as a value. It is also hot. And we're just going to say, I don't know, not in the mountains. So there is no value for Hickory in the client table. One row, okay. And then we're gonna say insert into client, uh, name, age, shirt, size, and city, close, values, and then we're going to say um, Bobby. I don't know. I just like the name Bobby. Uh, Bobby is going to be 22. Bobby is going to have a shirt size of large. And Bobby is from uh, Seattle. Then we're going to close the parentheses, close that. Boom. One row affected, right? Select 
all from clients. There we go. So we have Bobby down here from Seattle. That doesn't match with any of the city tables. Um, and from that, we're going to go to inner joins. So what an inner join is going to do is we're going to join two tables together, but they we're only going to display the records that match, that have a corresponding uh, record in the other table. Uh, so basically... Um, in the uh, the client table, there'll be a city. If that city is in the city table, that record will show up. Uh, if the city is not in the city table, none of it will show up. If you have a city in the city table with nothing corresponding to the client table, that record won't show up either. So this will only bring back the results where there is a match across both tables. Uh, so with this, we can do select uh, all... Uh, from uh, client, and then we say inner join. So we're going to do an inner join um, uh, city. So client is the first table. We're going to inner join on the table city, and then we're going to say on client dot city equals city dot city. Right, so select all columns from both tables. This is going to be a mess when I show it to you. From client, enter join city on client.city. So the client table with the, uh, the city column and the city table with the city column. And I hit enter, and we got this big old mess. We got ID, name, a shirt size, city, ID, city, state, climate, description. So we have all of this. Right? This is a little difficult to see on the screen, but again, we can pull out only specific column names if we want to. So uh, let's do control L. We have this. So currently it says select all. So one of the things I can do is I can say simply uh, client dot name. So I want the client name value uh, and the city dot description value. Right? So let's say I want people's name and I want to know the what the city looks like. I hit enter, and so here I can see Bob is in a kind of hippie town in the mountains. Sue, a tiny town, a river town in the mountains. Sam, not a hip, in not a hippie town. Phil, a kind of hippie town. Tammy is also in a kind of hippie town. So this way, across both tables, right? I have a table for city and a table for clients, and now I can pull this together so that I can query across those two tables. And so that's what an inner join is. Now the issue with an inner join is you might have a lot of orphan records, right? You may have a lot of records where again, your employees didn't plug in the city like they were supposed to, or they plugged in names that don't correspond in the city table or whatever else, right? And you don't see that here. So one of the things you might want to see is again, orphan records, or you might want to see all the records from one table, again, even if they don't correspond to anything in the other table, just to know what, what, what records you have to go through and update and to modify, right? right? So if I can do control L, one of the things that I can do here is I, I look at this and I say select city name, city description from client inner join city uh, on client.city or city.city. So one of the things I can do here is I can simply go to this join and I can say left. So what a left join means is when I'm looking at this, right? Client is left city is right. People say like, how do I know which side it is? It's like, well, well, that's to the left of that, right? That's to the left of that. And that's to the right of that. So therefore that's left. <laughs> Not that hard. Anyway, so left, what a left join does is it says, give me all the records for the left hand table, even if nothing corresponds to the right hand table. So if I hit enter here, what this will show us is Bob, a kind of hippie town, Sue, Fred doesn't correspond to anything. Huh, that's interesting. Maybe I misspelled something. Uh, and Bobby uh, doesn't correspond to anything. So those two records, uh, whatever their city is, doesn't correspond to anything in the city table. So now I know I can take a look at this and go, okay, I need to, uh, I need to update Fred and I need to op update Bobby. Uh, then we just simply have a right join. And do you know what the right join is? The right join is simply to say, give me all the values for the right table, 
even if nothing corresponds on the left table. So give us all the city values, even if it doesn't correspond to anything on the client table. I hit enter, and so what we can see here it's a kind of hippie town, kind of hippie town, all these things. And we see a kind of hot flat town. Oh, so Hendersonville, I probably misspelled that, is a null and not in the mountains is a null. Uh, so to get to make this a little easier, right, this is a description. So what I could do is simply say city. And so what I can see here, oh, Hendersonville, uh, see, I misspelled. I was the employee today. I misspelled. So Hendersonville doesn't match to anybody. And Hickory, as I purposely did, doesn't match to anybody. So this way I can go, oh, I need to, I need to edit Hendersonville. Right? So inner join gives you back the results. Uh, that match from both tables. Any records that don't match across both tables are dumped. Left join gives you all the records from the left-hand table, and then nulls for the right-hand side, if there, isn't, if there isn't a record on the other side. A right join gives you all the values for the right, and you know gives you nulls on the left. So that's basically what we're looking at with inner joins, left joins, and right joins. Now we get to lesson 11, subqueries. So what a subquery is, is we do an initial query, and then we query based off of the results of that initial query, right? Uh, so in this particular example, I want to get the average age um, of my clients, uh, but I only want to get it uh, from the oldest clients. Uh, so again, imagine I have a school or I have something, and I, I want to know just, you know, the top 25% or the top top 25 people, what is their average age or what is their min max age, that type of thing, we can do a limit. So what we do here is we do a uh, select and then uh, we say AVG age and then we say from but then we open up a parenthesis. So we're going to do a sub query here. And then we do a select. I'll just simply do all to make my life easier. Uh, from client order by age, right? Because I want it ordered by age. Uh, descending. So I want the highest age first. And then I'm going to limit three, right? So basically what this is going to do is it's going to select all from clients, order by age, reverse order highest age first, and then I want the first three to come back. And then I actually need to give this subquery a name. So I'm just simply gonna say as subquery. Uh, it's important to understand, this is just a name. I could name this Bob. I could name this Bob. I'm just naming it subquery to make it sound professional. Uh, and this will give me the average age um, of the three oldest people in my table. I come back, and so the average age of the three oldest people uh, are, is 51, right? So that's one thing you can do with a subquery. So that's a get big thing like in the, in the SQL world is it's not that SQL is complicated, it's mentally working through how to write these SQL statements to get you the information that you need. Uh, and that's why, again, in the tech world, you know, that's why we have all these whiteboards, so we can scribble all this stuff out, figure out exactly how to design whatever it is that we're designing, and then we just, we just plug it into the system. Now we get to lesson 12. For us, the important thing with lesson 12 is the next lessons that we're going to do, we're going to be writing Python scripts. Uh, and so we need Python to be able to connect uh, to, to MySQL, to be able to do what it's going to do. And so in order to have that work, we need to create user accounts so that there's a user account for Python to connect to. Uh, so we're not going to go deep into these user accounts, but it is important to understand that they exist. So within MySQL, you can create different user accounts you can give them permissions or what are called privileges in the MySQL world to specific tables, to databases. Uh, you can say that you can read. You can say you can insert. You can say you can only update. Just like in the Microsoft world where there's just, a, you know, 50 different permissions that you can give to users, the same thing is true uh, in the database world. And the important thing to think about here, again, when we start thinking about that security envelope uh, in cybersecurity, is remember, even if somebody is able to hack your system, a hacker is able to do a SQL injection attack, if the user account that's connecting to the database server doesn't have the ability to do many things, then even if they can, in, they can do the SQL injection attack, it will still fail 
because the account that's connecting to the server doesn't have permission to do whatever it is that they're trying to do, right? If it only has the ability to do select or it even only has the ability to do insert, right? If you have an account that only has the ability to do insert, even if somebody's able to do a SQL injection attack, they will not be able to pull records out of your database because that account doesn't have that ability. So again, very important to be thinking about that whole cybersecurity world. Uh, so what we're going to be doing here is we're going to be creating a user account. Uh, so we're going to create an account uh, user. So create user, single quotation mark, and then you put whatever username it is you want. We're just going to use user because because my brain is cooked. My brain is cooked. You want. You want creative, go somewhere else. Uh, then we're gonna say add, uh, and we're gonna put local host. So notice on both sides of this, both sides of this, these are enclosed within SQL quotation marks. That's just kind of how MySQL does it. So we have a user at local host. So you could have an IP address here. Again, when you start talking about security, you could have user accounts for specific servers. User at 192.168.1.10. So when a user, when the user account, the user user, user user, tries to connect to the MySQL server, it, if it's from 192.168.1.10, it'll be allowed to happen. If it's from anywhere else, it'll fail out. Again, another thing to be thinking about with security. Uh, and then we're gonna say identified by, single quotation marks, one, two, three, four, five, six. And there we go, and you put in whatever password it is you want to put in, uh, then you hit enter. And okay, so that actually worked out. Uh, then what we're going to do is we're going to uh, grant privileges. So these are basically security permissions in my uh, MySQL database. So grant all, oh, P-R-I-V-I-L-E-G-E-S. I've been like, <laughs> I don't know why. You know how you like, you get stupid about certain things. The word privilege is just rah. Anyways, um, let's see, on, so star, so star is for database. So you could put any database here. So company, you could say company database. We're just gonna say all databases to make our life easier, period, star. So we're gonna give all privileges. So basically we're gonna give root level permission. Don't do this in the real world, but again, this is a class. We're gonna give root level permission on all databases, period, all tables. Um, and then we're going to say to user at local host. So there we go. Give basically root level permission within MySQL to user at local host. And we see OK. Uh, and then we say show grants. So privileges are given by grants in the MySQL world. Again, one of the big things in technology is we have so many words for the exact same crap. <laughs> but it's true. For user at local host so it's grants here and then this just shows us all the uh, all the grants for a user at local host so grant select insert update grant application password and again there's lots and lots flush user resources persist ro variables there's a whole bunch of permissions but we're just not going to get into that tonight um, and then you can also revoke privileges and i have that again in the notes so you can do revoke all uh, like on class from user at you know local host so basically you can remove those privileges too now once we've done that we have the user account we want to verify the user account works so we're going to exit e-x-i-t and we're now back at the command prompt. So I'll do clear to clear the screen. And we're at the Linux command prompt. From here, what we're going to do is we're going to type in my SQL, not sudo, not sudo, because we're actually using a user account this time, hyphen u. We're going to give it the username. So our username simply is a user. Then we do hyphen p. It's then going to ask for that user's password, not the sudo password, not the Linux password, the password that we just gave to that user in MySQL. And now we are in MySQL and we're in MySQL as user. And so again, we would be prevented. We're allowed to do stuff or prevented to do stuff from the privileges that we've been granted. Uh, so that's the basics of creating a user account and privileges. Again, with all of this stuff, if you want to figure out more, <laughs> W3 schools, just go there, do a couple of searches. It is really, really, really simple once you understand what you're supposed to do. 
So now we're going to get to the exciting stuff. We're going to be having Python communicating with MySQL. Now the big thing to remember is when you have Python communicating with MySQL is there is a connector, a MySQL Python connector that actually allows Python to communicate with MySQL. So we're actually going to have to install that within pip for this to work. Uh, so basically we simply do sudo apt install pip. So if you're using if you're using Ubuntu, pip is not installed by default. So we're just going to make sure that it's actually installed. Uh, for me, I don't have anything additional to be done, so that that is actually in, been in, that, that actually has already been installed for me. I'm going to clear. Then I'm simply going to do pip three uh, install i s q l hyphen connector hyphen python. And so this will install this connector. I need this for Python to be able to connect with MySQL. It's going to go through. And again, for me, it's already installed for you. It'll say yes. You say yes. And you go from there. So that is all uh, pretty simple. From there, we're going to go over to VS Code. right? So VS Code is our IDE of choice. And uh, I already have this code written out. So this is... This is just a little simple snippet of code. And what this is going to do is it's going to verify that our Python can communicate with our MySQL server, right? Again, especially if this is over the network, before you get into like major troubleshooting, right? Just make sure that you can connect properly. Uh, so we import the MySQL.connector module so that we actually are able to connect to MySQL. Then we create the my, MYDB object. So this can be named whatever you want, but it it equals mysql.connector.connect, open parentheses, host equals local host or the IP address of the server. If you're going over the network, user equals whatever the hell your username is, password equals whatever the hell your password is. Again, I had that with some students last night where for password, they typed in password. <laughs> and then here they typed in one, two, three, five, four, five, six, and then it wasn't working. <laughs> ah. <laughs> You type in whatever the hell your password is, All right? Uh, then we close that. Then see here, we're simply going to print my DB. So this is going to print the values of the object and hopefully it works out properly. So I hit enter down here, we should get a result. And so, okay, we can see the script fire off. And then this is all we're getting. We're not getting anything fancy here. MySQL.connector.connection, sext, blah, 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 blah. All right, so if you get this, it works. To be clear, uh, so if we go down here, let me clear. Just to understand, so if I do something like that and I hit go, then you get failure. So if you get this, something is wrong somewhere. If you get the other thing, then everything is right. That is what you're going to be looking for. So now we get to lesson 14 and we're going to be using Python with MySQL and we're simply going to be doing select statements. So I'm kind of trying to show you here how to pull information out of the MySQL database and then be able to parse it. So we're actually going to be doing some concatenation down here with F strings. Some of my students asked me, it's like, why do you hate F strings? And I was like, well, I don't hate F strings. I guess we should use F strings. So now we're going to be using F strings. You will understand that joke if you've been following along at home. Anyways, if we go and take a look at this, um, I can basically show you how these selects work, right? So import MySQL connector as we did before. MyDB, we create an object, mysql.connector.connect, as we did before. We add here the database. So we're going to be accessing the company database. That's additional. Then we go here. So we're going to create, there's a cursor function, right? And the cursor function is kind of what it sounds like. It's a way of interacting with the database, pushing and pulling data from the database. So my cursor, we're just going to create an object. My cursor equals my DB dot cursor, right? So basically we're going to feed all of this information to the cursor function. And then that is going to be my cursor my cursor dot execute and then we're simply going to put a very simple uh, sql statement here select all from client right then my result equals my cursor dot fetch all so this fetch all function will go to my cursor and put all of those values into this python variable then we go here print records for client table for x in my result print x 
So all the records, it will simply print out, make life easier for us. Uh, let's see, then we have mycursor.execute. Just to show you, you can do a join here. Select all from client, enter join city on client.city equals city.city. .city. That was the simple that the join statement we did before. Fetch all, values go to my result. Uh, print records for join tables for x in my result, the join table, print it out. If you want to print specific indexes, so basically when these are getting printed out in the X, you have indexes 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, so all of those different columns. So here we're going to say the name, so basically for specific indexes, all records in join table for X and my result. So print X, X at the one index is the name home is x at the four index at the fifth position which is index number four uh, is the city or something like that which is and then it gives us the description of the city so it'll say the name city description of the city and then we can print out the full output for my results and if we want to print out a single index value for my result so let's go through here and actually run this script real quick so, okay, so we are running this ad, running this script. Okay, records for client table. So these are all the records just in the client table. And you'll notice this essentially comes out as a list, uh, index zero, index one, index two, so on and forth, so forth. So we have Bob, we have Sue, we have Sam, we have Phil, we have Fred, and we have Tammy. Right, pretty simple as we dealt with before. Uh, then we have records for the joined table. Record one for Bob, 33 large, Asheville. Asheville over here, North Carolina temperate description. Phil, 54 medium, Asheville, right? Uh, Sam, 44 medium, Weaverville. Weaverville, North Carolina cold, not a hippie town, so on and so forth. So this is simply up here where we have the joined table. We're simply printing out all the values in the joined table. Now here we go to the specific index. Because again, concatenation is a big thing, especially with dealing with databases. It's not simply about being able to pull data out. It is about then formatting that data into something the user cares about, right? So print F, so this is an F string. Again, the value for the, for the second index, for the fifth index, for the 10th index. If we go down here, specific indexes for all records and join table. Bob, home is Asheville. So Bob, home is Asheville, which is a kind of hippie town. Uh, Sue, Sue's, Home is Weaverville, uh, which is not a hippie town, right? That kind of gives you the idea right there. Then if we come down here, uh, print the full output for my result when we take a look at this object. So we can see that this is a list. So that my result that we created uh, is a list. So when we have a square bracket, square bracket open, square bracket close, that's a list. So in this particular list, you'll see commas, so we have parentheses and then commas. So this, it, Bob, it, Bob 33 large, everything between these two parentheses is at index zero. Everything between these parentheses is index one. Everything between that parenthesis all the way to wherever is index two, so on and so forth, right? So this is printing everything out. Then we go down here and so we say, print my result one one so we want the index so basically we want to print from the second position second position right so so again remember when we're dealing with indexes it starts at zero zero is the first position one is actually the second position so if we come down here and we take a look at it okay so this is record one right to here that's not what we want we want record two so this is what we want and then we want one here so two, the ID is zero, and then we get Sue. So one, one. And then when we come down here and we take a look at this, we see that we printed Sue out. So this is just a very, very simple example of how you can have MySQL connecting to, um, uh, or I'm sorry, yeah, in Python connecting to MySQL and actually being able to do these queries to pull information out and then trying to present something that's useful to the end user. So we're almost to the end. 
I wonder how many viewers have stuck around this far. It's interesting. You go to YouTube analytics and you see so many people start a video. <laughs> Almost no one ended. <laughs> you always kind of want, I always kind of wonder, like, could I, could I just put in like static from the 50% mark on and nobody would even know the difference? Anyways, can't do that. So we're going to go to lesson number 15 here. And basically, we're going to be doing a sensor simulation. So one of the things that I think is very important for my students is that we either solve real-world problems in our labs or we simulate solving real-world problems to really hammer home. We're not here to learn functions. We are here to learn how to solve problems, right? And so this is an example of imagine you have sensor data coming in, uh, and then you want to create an HTML dashboard to be able to display that sensor information uh, to be able to, you know, give you data to do something. So imagine if you had a server room and you had a temperature sensor in the server room, that was coming constantly feeding information into your MySQL database, and then you had Python uh, constantly querying that database, grabbing the latest records, and then literally creating an HTML web page that auto-updates for you to show you what the current temperature is, what the minimum temperature was, what the maximum temperature was within a certain time frame. So that is what we are going to be doing in this particular project. Uh, the first thing that we actually have to do, though, is we have to create a table. Uh, so this is this, this is the script. We're not going to deal with the script right now. We are going to go over and we're going to go back to MySQL. So make sure you're in MySQL. Not Linux. <laughs> make sure you're in MySQL. Uh, let's just uh, you know, show tables. Make sure where I'm at. Oops. No database selected. <laughs> make sure you know where you're at. Uh, use company. Um, okay. Database has changed. I can do show tables. Okay, so we have city and we have client uh, as we had before. So now I want to create a table for temperature. So this is going to take the, uh, the temperature values that our little Python script is going to be creating. So we say create table uh, temp, open parentheses. Uh, then we say ID, because I always give everything an ID. Int uh, auto increment uh, primary key. Uh, then we do uh, comma, uh, then we simply do temp, right? Yeah, so temp int. Uh, so all this is going to do is it's going to give us an ID just to give us a primary key, and then it's going to get the temperature value. Uh, it might be better, again, if you're doing a real-world project, to do a timestamp. You can actually auto timestamp values. We're not doing that today because this is simpler. Uh, okay, so then I'm going to do that. Okay, so uh, our table was created. Uh, describe temp. Okay, so we have an ID, auto increments, we have a temp, which is an int, that's all we need. So now we're going to go over to our script. So this is the script, and again, it's a pretty simple script, like all the scripts that simulates the concept of some kind of temperature reading. Uh, so import MySQL connector, as we did before. Now we're going to import the rand int function from the random module. So basically this is going to be how we get a temperature value. Again, to simulate a temperature value, we're just simply going to use rand int to do it. Then from time import sleep, we are going to have a constant. We're going to have a while true loop to make this thing run. And so while true will literally go as fast as it possibly can. That doesn't really help us. So we want to sleep. We want to delay, delay the script for a couple of seconds. So we're going to bring that in. Okay, as we had before, my DB, my SQL connector connect, localhost user, one, two, three, four, five, six, whatever your password is, and company. Again, that cursor, so cursor for my DB equals my cursor. So this is going to be our connection into uh, the MySQL database. While true, very dangerous. Danger, Will Robinson, danger. What while true means is it will go forever and ever and ever. Amen. <laughs> Until you physically stop it one way or another, this loop is going to continuously go. Be careful when you use these loops. I talked about that before. We did our AI class, especially Dolly. Dolly costs two cents for every image that you get from Dolly. So if you did a while true loop and you were querying Dolly, that could get very expensive, like 
truly quickly. So be careful with while, while true loops. But anyways, uh, so here we go. So we have temp, so we're gonna create it to get the temperature value. So we're gonna have a temp variable. Temp equals a random int between zero to 100, right? Zero, 100, random, give us, uh, give us that and it'll be temp. Then what we're going to do is we're gonna create our SQL statement here. So SQL equals insert into temp, temp, so into, insert into the temp table, the temp column, values, and then you do the, uh, the percentage sign S. So basically, um, this, is, this is a pointer for the value down here. So we simply do percentage sign S. We don't actually put in the variable value yet. We then come here, val equals, so these are the values we're going to put in, equals, and then we do, do temp comma. So with these values, you could put in multiple different values if you had multiple rows. So you do have to make sure you put that comma at the end or it won't work. Then we simply say my cursor dot execute the SQL statement with these values. Then we do mydb.commit. Uh, so there's something with MySQL with Python. If you don't do the dot .commit, it might not actually be committed to the database. Kind of like you have to, you have to close files, uh, you know, when you're dealing with files. Uh, you have to commit. So mydb.commit. And then we're going to print out down here on our screen temperature just to make sure we're getting that random temperature in. So then we're going to say my cursor dot execute select. So now we're going to be selecting, right? This was an insert. Now we're selecting. Select minimum temperature, maximum temperature, average temperature from a subquery. Select temp from temp, order by ID descending, right? So basically, uh, what this is going to be is it's going to order by. So the, the, the largest ID will be first descending. So the latest, the, the most recent uh, re uh, record will be the first one. Uh, then we're going to say limit by five. We only want the last five. Again, think about this for a time period, the last minute, the last hour, the last day. And then we're going to call it as subquery as we did before. Right? Then we're going to do result equals my cursor dot fetch all. So for my cursor, we're going to fetch all the values from this query and we're going to dump it into result. And then we're simply going to print this out on our little command line screen, the result, again, for troubleshooting purposes. Then we're going to do file equals open. So we're going to open a file, dashboard.html. Uh, with W, so overwrite. This will either create or it will overwrite uh, the file that already existed. We're going to have header. So header is going to equal, uh, and this is the, the auto refresh. So HTML actually gives you the ability to auto refresh a page. And so this right here is simply going to auto refresh a page every five seconds. Then we're going to create the body. So the body is going to be everything that gets dumped in the body. Um, so uh, let's see here. So body, so it's going to say current temp. And then, so this is an F, so F string. So with an F string, you put the squiggly bracket and then the name of the variable, and then it'll dump the, the value there. So current temp equals whatever the temp is, break. Minimum temp equals, and so the result, right, result that we got from here, it's going to be an index 0, 0. So zero, zero is the minimum temp. Then we're gonna do maximum temp is at zero, one. And then we're gonna do average temp is at zero, two, right? So that is going to be everything that's printed in the body. The HTML then is going to be the, the F string, the value for header space, the value for body. So then we're basically creating this HTML document. Then file.write HTML, everything that's in HTML, file.close, sleep for five seconds. And so what this is going to do is this is going to run the script. It's going to create these fake readings for us. Uh, then it's also, it's going to put those into the database. And then from the database, it's then going to print out onto an HTML document so that we get some kind of dashboard. Uh, so from here, I'm gonna hit run. Hopefully it works. There we go. Uh, so what the current temperature is, and then this is results. And so again, when that, that whole zero thing, uh, when we go here, result zero, zero, result zero. So this is a list. So zero, zero is minimum. Zero, one is maximum. Zero, two is average, right? Then what we can do is we can come over here. 
so this is now being saved in our home folder. So by default, Python always saves into your home folder. Uh, we can double click on dashboard.html. Open this up in Firefox. Okay, so this is auto being created. Current temp is 92, minimum temp was 13, maximum temp was 92, average temp is 61. 57, so it's gonna keep going, and then it only is going to do these values for the last five, so the maximum temp, that is the maximum it's been, so it's now at 100. Now the minimum temp uh, in the last five iterations was 57, and so it's just going to keep doing this for us. And again, think about this being a temperature sensor uh, or, you know, whatever else. Uh, if we go over, so again, we've, we're in our, our MySQL. We have the, My, the MySQL console right now. Uh, let me clear so I can do select. Oh, all from temp. And then we can see these records, right? So it goes down to record 18. I can redo it. Record 19. Record 20, oops, there, record 21, right? So this Python script is now auto-updating the temp table. It is then reading from the temp table in order to give us something that looks like this. And so that's the final project for today. And I think this kind of takes you through, you know, most of what you need to understand with how MySQL works. We understand how to, to install a MySQL server. We understand how to uh, in, uh, set up a database. We understand how to do the tables. We understand how to read, how to write, how to select, how to update, how to alter, do all that stuff. We're now using Python then to directly interact with that MySQL database. And then from the information being pulled out of MySQL database, we're having Python dynamically write an HTML document. And so this kind of gives you at least an overview of the full life cycle, more or less of how an app would work with a MySQL backend. Yay, it's over. <laughs> it's over. Thank golly. It's over. <laughs> you know how long it takes to record these classes? <laughs> Oh my golly. Anyways, you know, it's pretty fun. It's a bit tiring to do, but but it's all good. Again, that's the technology world. It's it's tiring, but but fulfilling. You hear a lot of people talk about this whole drivel about passion. Passion's garbage. Passion is what you get to have your slaves do the labor for free. It's fulfillment. Fulfillment's what I would argue gets you there. But anyways, it does take a while to do these types of classes. Um, this uh, kind of, you know, rounds out uh, the, these first classes we've done uh, in this whole Python curriculum. Again, with the curriculum that I'm creating for here for Silicon Dojo, the idea is that we create modular classes that tackle very specific topics in technology. And then the more of these classes you come to, the more you see how it all gets super glued together in order to create larger projects, right? So if you just want to learn about Dolly, you could come to just our Dolly class or just ChatGPT, just our ChatGPT class, just SQL, just SQL. But since we're using Python as our standard language, I can also start to show you how all of this kind of stuff uh, ties together. So, uh, so originally, our very first class was Introduction to Python to show you how variables and lists and all that kind of stuff work in Python. Our next class was tkinter. Now, however you care, however you feel about the tkinter framework, it is a dirt simple framework for creating GUI apps, not web apps, GUI apps on the desktop. So that allows us to start playing around with front ends. Then once we had that, then we did the chat GPT class. So since we understood Python and since we understood tkinter, we then started to understand how the chat GPT API works so that we can make requests from the API, get the response from the API, and then spit that out onto, you know, a desktop app looking thing with buttons and whatever else, right? Uh, we did some formatting with CSS and, uh, and HTML to understand how to, how to make things look 
prettier if you're going to be creating an HTML document. We did Dolly again with the API calls. Now we're doing SQL. So now with SQL, uh, you know, if we made an API call to something, we got a result. Now we can then store that result into a database. And once it's in a database, we can then use tkinter or whatever else to create an app that now uses that database as a back end to try to pull out information that is relevant, that is useful. So that's how I'm trying to build all these classes. So they really, they really come together and you start to really understand how everything fits. That's the idea. I'll let you tell me if it's working. So anyways, that was a SQL class for the day. And again, SQL really is dirt simple. Um, I've been using my SQL for, I don't know, 18 years now. And again, for most projects, it's a really good uh, database server to use um, where there might be some questions is again, you start doing larger scale projects where you care about replication strategies and that type of thing, MySQL might not be the way to go. But again, for simple stuff, you know, the size of WordPress, it's pretty useful. Uh, you will see a lot of people nowadays like Postgres. Postgres has become the cool database server. It is, it is open source in the whole nine yards. Uh, when you look at it, I was doing some research on it recently, and there's this whole thing about, what is it? I think, I think Postgres is faster on inserts and MySQL is faster on selects. It's one way or the other. <laughs> but again, because they, they are different products, right? They're databases and they're relational databases and they use SQL, but it's like the difference between OpenOffice or LibreOffice and Microsoft Word, right? They kind of sort of are the same thing, but you know, slightly different. Uh, so you run into that. Again, Postgres versus MySQL. I do have to say, when I did research on it though, again, you do have to look at load and scale. <laughs> <laughs> if you're taking this class, it doesn't matter. <laughs> when you when you start when you start having a web server that gets the hell ha hammered out of it, then you're gonna have to worry about things like insert speed and select speed, so on and so forth. Uh, but really, that's about the class we got for today. Uh, again, I will I will take this moment since I've got it to uh, to shill for our um, our fireside chat. Again, we're gonna be having this fireside chat June 13th. Uh, the CEO and co-founder of Level IO. Uh, they have a really cool remote management system. Uh, really, I actually think it's great. If I still ran an MSP, I would definitely think about using it. Great price point, great product, the whole nine yards. Uh, so if you're in the Asheville area, or if you want to come to the Asheville area, uh, definitely come to this fireside chat. Um, as always, I enjoyed teaching this class. I honestly enjoy teaching the in-person classes better, but, you know, <laughs> take what we get. Uh, I hope to see you. I hope to see you uh, in in-person class uh, sometime in the future. But if not, as always, I enjoy doing this, and I look forward to seeing you next time.